In this topic, we're going to look at treating diabetes with insulin produced by gene technology. So by the end of this topic, you should be able to answer the questions, what is diabetes mellitus and how do you treat it? What are the advantages and disadvantages of synthetic human insulin? Then we're also going to look at what is a promoter and how can promoters be used when making human insulin? And then finally, we're going to touch on how to purify human insulin, but we'll go into that in more detail under the topic biotechnology. So insulin's got an A chain and a B chain. Now some people are unable to control blood glucose levels due to either lack of insulin or a loss of responsiveness to it. These people suffer from diabetes mellitus. So if you have a look at this diagram here, you, you can see a normal pancreas producing insulin. This insulin is going to attach to the insulin receptor on a cell surface. This means that glucose can be taken up by the cell. So this controls blood glucose levels. Now you've got two forms of diabetes mellitus. Type 1, which is also referred to as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, is due to the body being unable to produce insulin. It normally begins in childhood and is therefore also called juvenile onset diabetes. It may be a result of an autoimmune response whereby the body's immune system attacks its own cells. So the beta cells of the islets of Langerhan are affected. In type 2, which is also referred to as insulin-independent diabetes, this is due to the glycoprotein receptors on the body's cell surface losing their responsiveness to insulin. It may, however, be due to an inadequate supply of insulin from the pancreas. Now, type 2 diabetes usually arises in people over the age of 40 and used to be known as mature onset diabetes. There are, however, some recent cases of obesity and poor diet leading to type 2 diabetes in adolescents. This develops slowly and the symptoms are normally less severe. People who are overweight are particularly likely to develop type 2 diabetes. So how do you treat diabetes mellitus? Well, type 1 is treated with injections of human insulin. Now, insulin can't be taken in by the mouth or at the mouth. This is because being a protein, it would be digested in the alimentary canal. So therefore, you inject it typically twice or four times a day. And the dose of insulin must exactly match that required for the glucose intake. If too much insulin is injected, the patient will experience hypoglycemia, where the blood glucose level will drop and could result in unconsciousness. So to ensure the correct dose is injected, blood glucose levels are monitored using biosensors. Type 2 diabetes is treated by controlling the intake of carbohydrates in the diet and matching this to the amount of exercise taken. This may in some cases be supplemented by injections of insulin. Until recently, insulin was extracted from the pancreas of pigs or cows. This insulin is slightly different from human insulin and may cause side effects. So through the use of gene technology, it's now possible to produce insulin using genetically engineered bacteria. Right, let's have a look at a few advantages of synthetic human insulin. Take a moment to think about what some advantages could be. Well, it's more effective because it's an exact copy of human insulin, whereas animal insulin has slight differences. The insulin matches the human cell surface receptors on the membranes exactly, so the response is quicker. There's no immune response. There's no risk of infection being transferred with the insulin. Animal insulin can transfer some diseases. Tolerance will not develop. Some people develop tolerance to animal insulin and become less sensitive to it.
It's cheaper to produce large volumes than extracting and purifying animal insulin. And finally, there are fewer ethical and moral objections because animals are not involved in its production. Whilst the animals from which human insulin was extracted were killed primarily for food, many vegetarians and others were unhappy using an animal product in this way. Okay, disadvantages would be possible contamination of the product by the host cell, although purification processes have eradicated this problem. Yeast is also being used as a vector and it secretes an almost complete insulin molecule, so less purification is needed. There were initial reports of more hypoglycemic incidents using human insulin rather than porcine. However, these were anecdotal and not supported by evidence. Okay, let's have a look at producing insulin. Now, in the past few topics, we've seen how we can use gene technology to introduce a gene into a vector. This vector is going to be put into a host cell, which is bacteria, and that's via the process of transformation. These bacterial cells then contain the recombinant DNA and need to be identified. Once they're identified, they're grown up. Then we need to look at how to switch on this gene so that it produces your protein insulin. So the gene for the production of insulin needs to be switched on, and we're going to look at that in a moment. And this is controlled by a region of DNA called the promoter. So here you can see a section of DNA. An operon is a gene or cluster of genes under the control of a single promoter. It comprises three units. You've got the operator, the promoter, and then your gene. The regulator is not part of the operon, but it does control the operator. Now the promoter is a sequence of bases upstream of a gene where RNA polymerase binds. Now in prokaryotes, the promoter is two short sequences. These don't sit right next to the gene, but are actually 10 base pairs away, or 35 base pairs away. The TATAT box, well I say TATAT box, T-A-T-A-A-T -A -A sequence, is 10 bases upstream of the gene and essential for transcription. TTGACA is 35 bases upstream from the gene, and this allows for a higher rate of transcription. Okay, so how does all this work? The regulator gets transcribed into messenger RNA, which is then translated into a repressor molecule. This will bind to the operator and prevent the RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter and transcribing the gene, as you can see here. If this was the LAC operon, then all this would occur if there's no lactose present, so your beta-galactosidase gene will not be transcribed. If lactose is present, the lactose molecules will bind to the repressor molecule and change its shape so that it cannot bind to the operator. This means that RNA polymerase can now bind to the promoter and start to transcribe the gene. Now how can we use this in insulin production? So if you look at where to insert your human insulin gene, you need to make sure that you insert it alongside a promoter so that your RNA polymerase will transcribe your gene. Um, we've already discussed the promoter for the beta-galactosidase gene. Where do you think you're going to insert your insulin gene in this section of DNA? 
You can insert it either next to or in between the beta galactosidase gene. So if you insert it in between the beta galactosidase gene, when you add, so you can see it here, you've got your bacterial plasmid with your insulin gene inserted between the beta galactosidase gene. Now, when you add lactose to the medium that your bacterial cells are growing in, RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and then start transcription of your beta-galactosidase gene. Your insulin gene is also going to be transcribed. When this RNA polymerase reaches the end of the insulin gene or the stop codon, it's going to stop transcription. So you're going to end up with your messenger RNA containing part of the beta-galactosidase gene and then your insulin gene. So the resulting amino acid sequence from translation of your messenger RNA will have the beginning of the beta-galactosidase enzyme and your insulin attached. These two are going to be attached by methionine between them. The bacterial cells are then treated with lysozyme detergent to break them open. The proteins are then isolated And then your protein is going to be treated with cyanogen bromide, which will split the chain at methionine. So you've got your A or B insulin chain separate from the start of the beta-galactosidase enzyme. And then finally, your A and B chains are separated by chromatography and they're mixed together so that they form disulfide bridges. Humulin is one of the branded names. So your human insulin can now be marketed. Okay, what have we looked at in this topic? Well, we looked at diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2. Remember that type 1 is due to the beta cells not producing insulin. This is treated with insulin injections. And we looked at the advantages and disadvantages of using synthetic insulin. We also discussed what a promoter and an operon are. Remember that a promoter is a sequence of nucleotides upstream of the gene, and the TAT-AAT sequence is usually 10 base pairs upstream of the gene. So when you are looking where to put your gene into the DNA, it needs to be downstream of the promoter. We discussed the promoter for beta-galactosidase gene and how it's regulated by the presence of lactose. So if you insert your gene in the middle of the beta-galactosidase gene, it will be transcribed when the lac operon is switched on. And finally, we discussed how to separate your human insulin from the beta-galactosidase. Um, and then... We also looked at treating the bacterial cells with lysozyme and a detergent and then the chain A and B being separated from the beta-galactosidase by cyanogen bromide. These two chains are then mixed together so that disulfide bridges form between them and your final product is going to be made of two chains, the A and B chain, and this can now be marketed. And that concludes our lesson. The end.